This is a standalone message this morning. We start a new series next week called uh, My Favorite Things. So it's a Thanksgiving series. I'm super excited about that. I do, yes, I do actually like the musical. Uh, it is 50 days until Christmas, in case you've missed it. This is one of the most exciting. I mean, we're right there, man. We're halfway through the 100 day countdown to Christmas. And so that's today. But. Today, this once-off message is actually a little bit of an effort to kind of connect the last two series we did here at 828. So uh, about, I guess, the church series, we just finished last in four weeks. So four weeks previous to that, I think we did a five-week series that was just simply titled Jesus. Nothing fancy about the title, but an incredibly impactful opportunity to just really speak about who Jesus is and how knowing him defines who we are. And then we landed in, as I said, for the last four weeks, a series called The Church. And unapologetically, man, I love the church. I believe in the church. It was constructed by God for God and his people. Jesus himself said, as I said, the entire series, Matthew 16 uh, uh, to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. And even from the beginning in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, it was all about building the church. Two thirds of the New Testament are letters and such written to, man, I'm getting redundant, the church. And I want to talk to you this morning, just a message simply titled strategic connections. You know, our lives are full of connections and they're meant to be strategic. I know some of you and your area of, um, your field of study or your career path or whatever, you recognize somewhere along the way, man, I need to know some people. You know what I'm saying? Like you recognize there are some strategic connections it would be helpful for you to make. But I believe that all of us are primarily meant and made to be connected to God and, and to people in the family of faith. Now, let me qualify that statement simply by saying we all need to have a sphere of influence in this world of people who don't know Jesus or don't know, come on, somebody, don't know Jesus yet. So if that makes you think that I'm saying that we shouldn't have non-Christian friends, you are not hearing my heart at all because I very much believe that we're meant to be in this world, but not of it. Right, like we need a circle of friends that are Christ followers. We, they are strategic. You hear me now? They are strategic. They're even critical, crucial, crucial connections for us to know God and to live into His will for us. We need this connection and we need these connections. Jesus wills for us to be both connected uh, vertically and horizontally, and that's what I'm going to try to teach today. Uh, strategic connections, man. When you think about even what that looks like in the physical world, there's a lot of connections that are really important too. Anybody in the house ever pull a trailer? You ever pull a trailer? You know, you hook that up to the back of your vehicle and that connection is important. Just give you a little heads up. You need that connection to, to be good, to be solid. I have my entire adult life pulled trailers. We have a 24 foot church trailer. I used to pull it to church to unload at the school and then the theater every Sunday till somebody took it away from me. That job, not the trailer. But, and I have since pulled that 24 foot trailer across, uh, halfway across America a few times to help people move. It's an occupational hazard. If you're a pastor, you help people move, especially if you know how, if you got a truck and know how to pull the trailer. Uh, and when I pull the trailer, it doesn't matter how intentionally I have connected it. Every time I stop, I just double check the connection. Do y'all know I'm already preaching? Did you know I'm already preaching? Like on the journey, I'll be like, okay, well, let's get out and double check this connection. Because man, the worst thing that can happen to you when you're pulling a trailer is you're driving along and you're like, that looks just like my trailer. Only it is your trailer, it just passed you. You know, that's not how you're supposed to pull a trailer. It's not supposed to pass you. I don't know if that's ever happened to you before. That's all I have to say about it. But have you ever, or have, maybe you've lost a tire, you know, because most cars have four of those and, and you need them all. You need all four. I don't know if you've ever lost a tire. Anybody driving down the road, throw your hand up real quick like, that's me. No, really? Okay, yeah, yeah. that's Jacob. You're my son. Of course you lost a tire because it's happened to me three times, three times in my life. Once when I was a kid, so I was the youngest of five and my mom was driving some car, I'm sure that was barely fit for the road. And I just remember we're driving along and mom said, there goes a the tire. And it's fascinating, but it takes a second for the car to fall. It really does. Like it don't just fall off and if you're moving a little bit. And then we started hitting. And it, 
it, it, this is for the old people, but it reminds you of an old Kenny Rogers song, right? You picked a fine time to leave me loose, Will. Okay. So I got you. I got the, I, I said that out loud to someone that was below 30 last night and they just, you know, their, their facial expressions are always priceless. It's like, hmm, I have no idea. That's okay. That's all right. Half the time, I don't know what you're saying either. <laughs> but, and I just want to say all three times that a tire came disconnected, I had nothing to do with the lug nuts. The second time it happened to me, I had just got tires put on a jacked and stacked four by four that I owned. And that last tire did not get properly connected, I was driving down the road. And again, I saw it before I felt it. I was like, there goes the tire. <laughs> it's a weird, weird thing to think. And then and I was like, well, there went our tire. The last time we were actually in the bush in Zambia and coming out and there, I think someone intentionally loosened our lug nuts because it's a good way to strand a vehicle to perpetuate some sort of thievery. Um, but it didn't work that way. We were able to reattach it and get on the way, but we were still in the sand. Thank you, Jesus, for that. But it was Carissa who's on the keys this morning. Her mom was in the passenger seat. Her name's Linelda. And I said, this thing feels weird. And she said, well, there goes our tire. <laughs> Just like that. Another thing that has a propensity to come disconnected is a boat motor. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. But I was talking to John, uh, John Federonco. He and Jenny lead our life group in Burgaw. And we'll lead our, our 828 Church Burgaw location coming up sometime in the not too distant future. And he's a big fisherman. And he said, yeah, you stick that thing in reverse. If it's not attached properly, it's coming to see you. Mm. Here comes a here comes a trolling a trolling motor particularly has a propensity to do that. But I think we understand a lot about strategic connections. Connectivity is something that we're blessed with in this world, right? I mean, with the internet, the advent of the internet and cell phones and always able to text. I remember when I got my first cell phone, there was barely any coverage anywhere and the thing was huge and I was in the military and I, I used to climb trees to try to find a signal to call my wife because I love her and I was not good at being apart from her. Connectivity is just such a special thing to be able to be connected. And if it's not always that we miss some sort of a physical connection, you know, sometimes it's something like, for instance, I know this will relate to everyone in the house, but you ever missed an exit? And I don't know what happens, but just for a minute, you forgot where you were, what you needed to be doing. And then there's like, that was my exit. That's great. In most places, that's not much of more than a five mile problem, but occasionally I've been some places where you had to drive 20 miles down the mountain and turn around and come 20 miles back up, you know what I'm saying? And you miss an exit, it can be frustrating. Missing flights is no fun at all. And that's not usually something that you can avoid, but it does happen. But these, if you miss one flight, you often miss your connection. I think it's just an amazing thing to try to be intentional about our connections. Sometimes we're making connection, but it isn't good. You ever text the wrong person? That's horrifying, right? You ever just, I mean, man, I'm double checking, especially if I'm going to send some sort of sweet note to my wife, you know, I'm like, okay, don't send that to Jacob. That's, mm. And, and often, I mean, like I wrote a message yesterday. It wasn't awkward, but I just was, it was going to be to the wrong person. I was about to send it. And I went, nope, that's not for you. You know, connections and being intentional about them. Sometimes when we miss a connection, we don't stay relationally connected. It creates some complications. There was a situation years ago where my brother-in-law had traveled across the U.S. with a minister friend of mine named Ronnie, and they had been on this crusade, and they had a whole team of people that went as far away as San Francisco. We had a lady in our first service that was visiting from just north of San Fran. But they had ministered in San Fran, driven all the way across the West. They were at the very end of weeks, summer, literally a summer of preaching and, and ministry. And James, Karen's brother, was the last person with Ronnie. Ronnie was tired, so he was sleeping in the back of the van. It was one of those old conversion vans, anybody. And they, the plan was for James to drive to his house, and then he would wake Ronnie up, and then Ronnie would drive the 190 more miles to his house. 
And so James was, it was his leg to be driving. They had to stop though for fuel. And when they stopped for gas, James pumped the gas. Ronnie's still asleep in the back of the van. He went in to pay. What he didn't know was while he was inside paying, Ronnie got out of the van to go in for a, a bathroom break. So then James comes back, gets in the van and drives on the two hours home. This was before cell phones. We take a lot of this connectivity for granted. I'm telling you we do. He gets all the way to his house and he goes to wake Ronnie up, but he's not there. <laughs> now, I joked with James about this. I said, man, I think you're, you, you weren't as saved as you thought you were or needed to be. You know, you weren't as confident in your salvation as you should have been. Because he said, I mean, Ronnie been preaching hellfire and brimstone all the way across America. And don't miss the rapture. He was that kind of old school preaching. And so when he wasn't there, he started to feel like maybe, you know, he done missed something. <laughs> And, hey, we grew up on some movies that scared the bejeebers out of you, okay? <laughs> and that's all I have to say about that. But <clears throat> then he, he hustled inside where his parents were supposed to be excited to see him. He's been gone for weeks and weeks and weeks. And they were gonna, he told them about when he would be home and they were going to be there. Well, unbeknownst to him, they had ran to the store, so they weren't there either. So now he's in full-on panic. <laughs> like he said, he literally sat down and started to cry. And he's, you know, humming left behind songs in his head. And then the phone rang and it was Ronnie. And he said, hey, James, you want to come back and get me at the gas station? Right? Connections. Sometimes um, we miss them. And I believe that in order to make them and keep them, we have to be uh, intentional. And, and... I think there's thinking required. Hebrews 10, 25, I've mentioned this several times over the last few weeks. Paul literally challenged us to not forsake gathering together. And it was in 1 Corinthians 12, we talked about the body of Christ, that every part, every member matters. And intentionally being connected in this context is necessary. A first takeaway for us this morning, if you're new to us, every once in a while I'll share a takeaway that sort of gives a synoptic of what I've said so far. And this first takeaway says, prioritizing strategic connections is crucial to God's work and will being accomplished in your life. I mean, that's a main point for this morning. Being intentional about those critical connections. We all need them. We're all called to make them. Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Again, I'm, I'm saying it and I'm not ashamed to say it. Your friend circle matters. Christ follower, uh, it, you need some friends in your life that will challenge you toward God. Person in the house who's trying to make a decision about faith, come on in, the water's fine. Uh, none of us have got this figured out. We all need God and we all still need each other. All right, so, you know, uh, better together is real, and, it, and we're only to be better together when we're better together with God. Galatians 6, Paul challenged the church and said this, share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. So it's not even just connect with each other or share each other's burdens because it's helpful. It is God's will for us. Obey the, God, come on now. God set it up this way. Obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to connect with others, okay, help someone. Literally, he said to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate the clarification. None of us are too important to care and carry the burdens of others, to care about and carry the burdens of others, and to intentionally stay and be connected. That's what the Word says. I feel like he almost was saying this. So we're, those of you, again, who have chosen Jesus, then you are a son or, or a daughter. And those of you who haven't, that's what you're made to be. You just might be living estranged from the relationship that makes that true for you, but it's still true for you. The reality is, though, you're not an only child. Well, I'm a child of God. Yes, and you're not an only child. You're called for to these horizontal and made for these horizontal relationships. And they're not all, all of your Christ following friends are not going to be in this one house. I know Leah, our executive pastor, her friend Lindsay was in town last weekend. They they stay, she's got other Jesus following friends that she stays connected with that are important investors in her life. She has local friends and distance friends. So can and should we. There need to be people, though. You got to have some people. 
and people in the house of faith that you walk and work with, somebody just help me out a little bit so I can preach a little faster. Just say this out loud. We all need each other. We all need each other. Now, I know some of you are thinking, but I don't want to need anybody. I almost don't even know what to say to that because it, you not wanting it doesn't make it any less true. And I get it on some level because people can be painful. Okay, I get that. That's true. But people are also important and we need each other in our lives. It was Shakespeare who said, he is not worthy of the honeycomb who shuns the hive because the bees have stings. All right, and there's honey in there. Right? There's something sweet about fellowship, even the kind that's messy and at times painful that we have to work for. It's still beautiful and it's powerful and it's important. And the fact that the enemy makes it such a high priority to keep us apart should tell us something about how much we need to be together. Move on, Ron. Okay, okay, I will. I will, I will. The purpose of the church is not just sermons and songs, but to be an environment of deep and real connected relationships, brother to brother and sister to sister. I accept that responsibility as a leader in the church. We work hard to facilitate that, but every one of us still has to choose it. It was uh, Jesus himself who said in John 15, 12, this is my commandment. You want to know what he said? Love one another as I've loved you. Ooh, that's a high bar. That's how we're called. That's not lazy love. That's not lackadaisical love. That's not costless connection. That's not because none of those things were true for Jesus. It was not lazy love. It was not lackadaisical. It was passion for the peoples. And it cost him everything. And he said, love the same way that I have loved you. And in Colossians 3, Paul said, you got to put that on. That's got to be on purpose. You got to put that on. He said, clothe yourself with love, which binds all us all together in perfect harmony. This morning I got up and I put on my jacket, right? I did it on purpose. And there are seasons and circumstances that at times make us want to step away from loving others well, and, but we got to put it on. It's what binds us together and causes us to live together in perfect harmony. I love that phraseology, that harmony. I love some good harmony. I love some good four-part harmony. There were some beautiful harmonies on this stage this morning, and there will be more. Why don't you just go ahead and sing, Grace? That was so good. She killed her song, and then she sang such beautiful harmony. Christy and David, all of them have beautiful harmony voice. I love the harmony. And our lives, I feel like I, I could start looking you in the eye. Some of you I have great relationship with, and I know that God allows our lives to be harmonious. We, we just sing a completely different, deeper, more beautiful song because we are together in it. And we're all, I mean, y'all can be quiet, but it's one of your options. You can also speak up a little bit. Come on, it's a beautiful thing to get to be together. We were made to be connected and we were tuned. We were tuned to be together. I'm not a guitarist. I play a chord or two, which doesn't qualify. But if you will get the top string tuned, I can tune the rest of the guitar. I can hear it. I can tune it. I just need somebody, or I can use a tuner to get that first string right. And I think that we're better together than we even believe we are or can be. I think we hear, we know, we just need Jesus to be the main uh, element in all of this. Yesterday, we got to see this. We got to see this harmony lived out. We were at, I mentioned a minute ago, the Hope Life graduation. So Hope Life is a program here in our church that uh, has an incredible group of guys who all live together. It's a live-in program. They are coming out of addiction. They, in the program, they start with regeneration, and then they go through inner healing, and then they land. The third phase is, is discipleship, and it's incredible incredible, incredible program. And yesterday at two o'clock here, we had a graduation. I'll make sure we do a better job of inviting you guys going forward. We'll move that to maybe a time that works better and we'll get you here because it is incredible. It was so powerful. 
And Scott, who graduated yesterday, oh my word. I mean, I picked on Miss Jenny, who's one of our life group leaders. I called her a crybaby, but I only did that in defense of the fact that I could, I mean, I, I couldn't breathe. It was so powerful. And Scott was sharing about how he was at a point where he was sitting on his porch and he just told God, he said, God, if, if I can't be free, then just take me. I mean, I, I can't do this anymore. I don't even want to keep living like this. And he reached out to a couple of friends, one who had at one time been a part of our church family named Steve. And Steve and a buddy bought him a ticket. They said, we know where you need to go. They bought him a ticket, put him on a bus and sent him to Hope Life. And he said he has been stabbed and he has been shot and going through the program was the hardest thing he's ever done. One of the things he shouted out was that Jeffrey, who's again a part of our church family, uh, he said that the countless hours that Jeffrey sent with him digging deep into his brokenness so that God could make him healed and whole. Critical, crucial, crucial, crucial relationships there's a quote that I love. It's really, there's no one specifically to give credit for it. Some people have given credit to C.S. Lewis, but it wasn't his quote. A friend is someone who knows the song in your heart and can sing it back to you when you've forgotten the words. We need those people. And that song is a God song. It's a God song. And it takes God in someone to sing that song, even to sing it back uh, to each of us. Still, though, as important as these Horizontal connections are, again, the most critical connection is this connection, the vertical connection that we have with God. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing, nothing. We all, all of us that know that verse at all can land on the emphasis in nothing. But don't miss the I'm the vine and you're the branches. We understand we can do nothing without them. But what can we do with them? What kind of fruit does your life produce? Because it tells a story. Because when the vine is connected to the branch or the branch is connected to the vine, there will be fruit and it will be God. It will be God fruit. I, years ago, I was making a, a decision that shouldn't have probably been as big or difficult as it was. And I was sitting with a friend who was recruiting me to move to another state to work with him in mission. And he knew that I was conflicted. And so he said, he's, he's a, a very gregarious, strong personality temperament type. And he looked me straight in the face and he said, God has a plan for your life and I know what it is. And... I smiled at him because I wanted in some ways for it to be what he said it was, but I said, I don't think it works exactly like that. And yet, I'm about to say to you, God has a plan for your life, and I know what it is. Yeah, now I just made some of you real uncomfortable. Yeah, I am a little bit of an underrated prophet. <laughs> I'm gonna let that hang out there just a little longer so I can see the discomfort on your face. Because like I told Grace, Papa gets to have a little bit of fun too. No, what I mean by that is this. God's plan for your life is for you to know him deeply and walk with him daily. That's another takeaway for us this morning. That is God's plan. God's plan is for you to know him deeply. I know that much. I can't work out the details. That's between you and Holy Spirit. But I know this is God's plan. This strategic connection is critical. And if you live into that, you're walking in God's will. In fact, if you want to be in God's will, you are. Like the most prominent part of being, it's not the complete truth, but the most prominent part of being in God's will is to have a heart that wants to be in God's will. Because if you'll choose that, God can get you there. That connection. You work on the connection. We spend too much time trying to figure out his will, missing on his will. Yes, yes, yes. Lean in. <laughs> Go to God. Stay close. You've never been this way before. Yes. Always true. Always true. There's two paths. There's not three. There's two. There's obedience and rebellion. There's connected or disconnected. And I know there may be varying degrees of connectedness. I do get that. But I think when you choose connection, God draws you close. Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. But I will say this to you. I will admit that this is true. There is a cost to connectedness. 
there is a cost. A relationship with God should be real, reverent, raw, and redemptive. It's all those things. It's real. And here's the thing about real. Real costs more. Real stuff costs more. I will say to you, those of you who are good at saving money, I could be a bit better at that sometimes. And if you have found good generic products, please pass those along. But my experience has been that you get what you pay for in terms of generics. So, you know, like if you have generic ketchup, I'm probably going to pass. Because <laughs> it's a lot of water before you get to the... <laughs> at least you got to shake it up real good. Generic potato chips. I haven't had potato chips in months, but if I were going to eat some, I'd just go ahead and splurge and buy some Lay's or some Ruffles or something, everybody. Don't be offended at me. I'm not a chip snob. I'm just saying. But, but you get the real stuff. Mm. Mm. The crazy thing, though, with God is that the cost, the price is a privilege. I mean, the exchange rate is incredible. Like what you pay, what you give up for what you get, there's no comparison. Come on, somebody that knows that's true. Somebody that laid something down, somebody that gave up an attitude or a perspective or a position who took a little criticism from somebody because they actually followed Jesus, whose circle of original friends think that you've lost your mind for the way you're following him, whatever that looks like for you. Somebody who did that and has found God faithful and understands that destinies are being released and peace and passion are being found, shout it out, shout it out. Uh, I had to stop because I was just getting <sighs> tight and right or loose and lost. I mean, we got to choose either tight and right with Jesus because without tight, we're never right. <laughs> or loose and lost. And when we know Jesus, the beauty of this, this, this I'm making, still making the case about how strategic this connection is. When we know Jesus, it handles so much stuff. It's such a, it's, it's just, it's an efficient way to live well. Just go ahead and spend your energy knowing Jesus. It's such an efficient way to live well because a lot of decisions just pile up on you when you have to just dig to do the right thing. But if you walk with God consistently, he'll take care of it. He'll get you there, right? So for instance, if you spend a lot of time listening to, you like hearing and also listening to, meaning doing what God says do, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. If you, if you lean into that, the reality is you get better at hearing him, right? You recognize his voice. So Karen and I have been married 35 years. We've been dating for two and a half before that. So it's been a minute. And, you know, she never calls me on the phone. And I'm like, uh, who is this? And it's not even just because I have caller ID. Like, how weird would it be if she called and said, hey. She never says, hey, it's Karen. I never call her and say, hey, it's me. It's Ron. Right? I don't do that. I know her voice. She knows my voice. She doesn't say, hey, it's Karen. And I'm like, Who? I feel like sometimes if we're honest, we have spent such a small amount of time on this strategic connection that God's like, hey, hey, don't know, hey, whoa, whoa, or hey, hey. And we're like, who are you? What do you want? Oh, I got to really pray. John 15, 7. Jesus said, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. Right? I love this particular translation. You will ask what you desire. Ask what you will. Ask what you desire, and it will be done for you. And it's Psalm 37. I always, there's a rough wrong compilation of two verses, and I'm about to share it with you as I often do. Psalm 37 and 4, which just says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will literally give you the desires of your heart. And I believe that that passage has multiple meaning. In, in what I mean by that, it means one thing, but it means it in a lot of ways. And that's that not only will God give you what you desire, but he'll put his desires in you. So that if we were to throw the two of these verses together, a quick smash up would be, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll want what I want you to want, and I'll give you what you want because I wanted you to want it. Point being, this connection 
Woo! It's important. It's powerful. It gets a lot done in your life. And you won't roll up on some decision that you're like, oh my gracious, I got to make this decision. I even know it's coming. And you're just stressed about it. It will be a gradual ascent with Holy Spirit rather than a cliff face that you got to try to find a way to climb. Just listening. I'll say it again. God's plan for your life is for you to know him deeply and walk with him daily. That's his plan. <sighs> yeah, ironically, David and Chris are going to join me on the stage, but ironically, our connection to God makes us good together, and our being good together is critical to our being connected to God. It's both. It's both and. It's water and wet. I'll let you soak that in for a second. And when we live like that, the song that our lives are meant to sing mm, comes through, I think, I believe, in beautiful tones, rhythms, and harmonies. It's incredible what that can look like. Max Licato in his book, I think it was the book um, Traveling Light from years ago, he had a, told a story about a, a shepherd that was up in the high country somewhere that had a little transistor radio on this particular uh, dude loved some classical music and he was a violinist and he would always listen and one day he before he went up on the mountain he called the radio station he asked them if when they had their show going they could that night if they could hit a middle C and the host said sure we can do that but it's really rare for someone to ask us to play a note they usually ask us to play a song and he said, well, I don't, I don't care which song you play. I just want to make sure I get my instrument in tune because I want to play with you. Middle C. Come on, everybody. Middle C. Colossians 1.17 says this about Jesus and the church. Paul wrote, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Why? Because he is the head of of the body, the church. And I saw a beautiful analogy. It was done by uh, Torn Wells. I was over in South Africa in August and got to just hear an incredible message that he shared and also spend a little time with him to talk about it. But he shared this story and it, it's not new to, or it wasn't original to Torn, but uh, he talked about how often we're like a guitar string. And some of us, if we're honest, we love our freedom. We don't want to be connected anywhere. But this string accomplishes nothing. I suppose you could use it to tie up a muffler. I'm not sure. Something like that. I, mean, I don't know. But this guitar, can you walk over this way, David? This guitar. So can you tell us about the design of the guitar? This is the body right here, the neck, and the head. So Jesus is the head. Step away from that podium just a little bit. Oh, you probably can't. That's all right. Sorry for the clunkiness, but this is important. So Jesus, in our analogy here, is the head, and the church is the body. Now, if this string is only connected to the head, can it play any music? If it's only connected to the body, can it play any music? There's a little tension required for those strings. A little bit of tension, everybody. A little pulling, a little tuning. But when you get it right, What's it sound like? Can you make this sound like that? Not unless it's connected to the body and the head. Romans 15, Jesus said, may God who gives this patience and encouragement to help you live in complete harmony with each other. Come on, somebody. As it is, as is fitting for followers of Jesus Christ, then all of you can join together with one voice. Ah, I love it. Come on, say amen to one voice, everybody. With one voice, giving praise and glory to God the Father. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ. 
Come on, worship team. Join us up here. Thank you, David and Carissa. And I'll finish with a poem. And this particular poem that I wrote is titled, Band of Believers. It goes like this, the lyric of my life, the song my heart is meant to sing involves a chorus full of others with all the harmonies that each brings. When we're connected to our Savior and he the maestro taps the stand, we should all join in and play, each one our part in his great band. Every instrument has a purpose, every player has a part, every note and bar and chord played in time with lots of heart. All this penned by the composer who writes the words and music too. He draws redemption from each verse, even when we sing the blues, the key to stay and play together to trust his rhythm, trust his plan. His melody heals and holds because he's the leader of the band. My prayer for us this morning is that we'll lean in to these strategic connections. Maybe you came to the house this morning and you're not walking with God. And even uh, now, before we lean into worship, I just want to give you an opportunity to give your heart to him. Maybe you're, you're far from him this morning and you know you need Jesus in your life. I want to ask you, before, again, we go back into worship, if you just bow your heads with me. And if you're in this house and you're like, man, I need to work intently, strategically on my connection with Jesus today, I'm not where I need to be with him. Would you slip up your hand? I want to pray with you. I just want to pray with you. Wow. Yep. Yep. And that means a lot of different things for a lot of people. I get that, but there are lots of hands going up. I need to come to Jesus again today. Anybody else real quick? I saw that hand. I got you. I got you. Yep. I see that one. I got you in the back. I got you. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being brave. That's big. That's big. We don't pray pretend prayers. Uh, we're not afraid to pray the same prayer, and we're going to do that today. Would you pray this with me, church family? And regardless of where you are in your walk with him, this is a prayer to, to take a step back to a relationship, or maybe even for the first time. Jesus, I know I need you. I want you in my life. Thank you for loving me passionately and persistently. Forgive me for any choices that I've made that have separated me from you. I'm coming home today to the heart you have for me. Be my savior, be my God, be my guide. Come on in Jesus' name, everybody.